So in the last lecture, we talked a lot about maximizing the amount of speed available to us through our internet connection between your local computer and the hosting platform. And we did some testing and talked about how to decide whether you should be paying for more download speed to your local computer or paying for better performance with your hosting service. In the end, our conclusion, I think, was that even though very fast internet speeds to pretty much anywhere on the planet or around the corner in four or five years, right now that's not the case. And it's a pretty safe bet that the connection to the remote server is going to be much slower than if you're running the database on your local computer off a local hard drive. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some other approaches that we can take to improving performance when working with a remote database. Now the most important thing should be to minimize the size of the data as much as possible. GIS data has both attribute data and geometry. Point geometry is always a single coordinate. Each coordinate is either two, three, or four double precision numbers, depending on whether your data has Z and or M coordinates or not. Most data only have two coordinates, and each one is a double precision number, so that's eight bytes. So 16 bytes per coordinate, which is the same amount of memory required for a text string of 16 characters. There's not much that we can do to change this for point data, but lines and polygons can have hundreds and even thousands of vertices. Each one requires either 16, 24, or 32 bytes of memory. And thus it's critical to do everything that you can do to reduce the number of coordinates in your features. If you can reduce a polygon from 2,000 vertices to 1,000 vertices, you save 16,000 or up to 32,000 bytes. And that's just for a single feature. And many times, especially if the geometry was derived through geoprocessing operations, there can be a lot of extraneous points that don't have much effect on the shape. And we can remove those extraneous points through the simplify function, which takes three parameters, a geometry object, a tolerance value, and a Boolean true or false value. So all vertices that don't affect the shape more than the specified tolerance are removed. So if you were collecting the center line of a road with a GPS that was recording a point every five seconds, those points would all be eliminated, at least assuming they were in a straight line and didn't affect the shape more than your specified tolerance. And only the start and end point would be needed because those center points don't provide any additional information. In fact, they themselves introduce error because GPS error would prevent them from really being in a straight line. And then the Boolean true or false value, that's also a parameter in the simplify function, just tells PostGIS how to handle the case where the size of the feature after simplification was less than the specified tolerance. And if you say true, then it actually keeps that feature without simplifying it. And if you say false, that feature is eliminated from the data set. So if you simplified a linear feature class, and you had a tolerance set to 10 meters, and there are some features in there whose total length was only 5 meters, you could decide whether you want to keep those short features or delete them. And you can easily simplify all the data in a table by using the update command like this. I should also mention that there is also an st underscore simplified preserve topology function it does a similar thing for polygons that form a topology so that there won't end up being gaps between polygons that are supposed to touch each other. Something else that you could do is to have multiple layers that get turned on and off automatically at appropriate scales by setting their scale-dependent visibility. A good example of this that many of us will be familiar with is the US NHD hydrology data, which comes in high, medium, and low resolution data sets. High resolution data has every single blue line found on US topographic maps at 1 to 24,000 scale. They're very detailed, but they're meant to be viewed at 1 to 24,000. If you have that layer on and you zoom out to 1 to 100,000 scale, you'll find that it takes a long time to draw that much data. And it tends to overwhelm everything else in the map. And if you have the misfortune of accidentally zooming that layer out to 1 to a million scale, it may take five minutes to redraw and fill the entire map with blue lines. You can prevent this by setting the maximum scale at which the layer is drawn at. For instance, at around 1 to 48k scale, the high-res data turns off, and the medium resolution data turns on. And that data has less detail, and this loads much faster. And a similar thing happens at some scale above 100,000, which is the scale that the medium resolution data is created for. And you can easily create a similar thing for, say, burrowing owl nests, where you create medium and low-res versions by simplifying with increased tolerance. 
if one meter tolerance was as much as you wanted for the high res data, maybe you go with 10 meter tolerance for medium resolution, because at that scale, you can't discern a 10 meter difference anyhow. And so it's not as important to be that accurate. And you could do something similar for low res data with even more tolerance. In this case, I set the tolerance to 50. Another solution, that I'm not going to dwell on too much, but in some cases you can minimize the precision of the coordinates. For instance, the SD underscore as GeoJSON function has an optional parameter that lets you determine how many decimal places a coordinate will have. If you're using a coordinate system that uses meters and you don't need more precision than one meter, you can have it return no decimal places. Because otherwise it would be sending 10 or so unnecessary decimal points across the web, and that's a big waste of bandwidth. It may not be as big of an issue with QGIS because we're getting binary data. But if you're accessing PostGIS from a web application, you're probably sending GeoJSON back and forth, and so you can save a lot of bandwidth that way. While coordinate data is a low-hanging fruit, you can also limit the amount of attribute data that is returned. Some data, especially from government agencies it seems, can have dozens of fields, but only a few that really contain useful information. So if you can select only fields that you need, you can potentially save a lot of bandwidth. You can also use virtual layers to create buffers and other geometries with a SQL query. This uses the client computer's CPU to create buffers on the fly rather than storing them on the server and sending them across the internet. Whether this is faster or not depends on your client speed as well as the server speed and internet speed. But it would be worth trying it out in your situation and seeing if it works for you. Now after we've done everything possible that we can do to minimize the amount of data that's actually traversing the web, we can also undertake some strategies that use a combination of local data and remote data to increase redraw speeds, and this can make a dramatic difference. The basic premise is that you keep a local copy of the data that's used for performance reasons when the detail isn't that important, such as when you're zoomed out past 1 to 20,000 scale and the width of a 1 millimeter line being displayed is more than 20 meters wide. It's far too low resolution to digitize accurately if you need 1 meter precision. Then you can use a remote copy when detail is important and you're zoomed in to very high resolution because at those scales there's not much data in the view and so redraws happen very fast. A very important consideration is that all editing occurs in the remote copy. This ensures that everybody makes changes to the same data set so there are not multiple versions, or at least not for long. And then the remote copy is occasionally propagated to one or more local copies to keep everything synchronized. The downfall is that there will always be some period of time in which the data sets are not perfectly synchronized but when you're zoomed in close enough for it to make a difference and actually edit anything, you'll be working with the remote data, which is 100% current. Any discrepancies will only be seen when you're zoomed out, when the scale is so large it makes little difference. There are a couple methods that could be used to implement this strategy depending on your specific situation, how often you need things to be synchronized, how your IT is set up, etc. In the real world, you would implement a replication scheme where the remote server is the master, and the local server or servers will be slaves. All changes occur in the master, and then they propagate automatically to the slaves as resources are available, and this all happens automatically, so everything stays as up-to-date as possible with no input from you. And this can work if you own the remote server, or if the hosting company that owns the remote server allows it, but you probably wouldn't be able to do this, at least on the cheaper hosted server plans. But you'll have to inquire with your hosting company to see if they would allow that in your situation. If you're sure that nobody will be working on the server late at night and you don't need very current data, you could automate a process that backs up the master every night and then restores it to the slaves for the next day. In its simplest form, this would require deleting the entire slave database and restoring it from the master, which couldn't be done when people are actually working on it. So it probably couldn't be done very often, especially during the day, and the slave data could be as much as a day old. Another strategy that I admit I haven't actually deployed, but it seems very plausible, and I think it should be something to consider, would be to use triggers to automatically create an audit log of changes made to the master database. And then use that audit log to make those same changes to the slave database on occasion. This could be automated with a crone job, or performed manually as needed, or both. This could be done while people are working on the slave, so it wouldn't present a disruption. And then possibly on weekends, you could do a complete restore to ensure that they are exactly the same at the beginning of every week. 
So let's go to QGIS and see how you would set something like this up, at least on the client side, and see how much it improves performance. And I think you'll be impressed. But if you want to set up a master server replication on the server side, that's beyond the scope of this course, and you'll have to come up with a plan if you're discussing it with your IT personnel. So I'm back in QGIS. Again, we have this same data set up from two different sources, from localhost or AccuGIS. And we see that in AccuGIS, it's a little bit slow when doing redraws, while the localhost is quite fast, almost instantaneous. And so we want to use this localhost data when we're zoomed out like this, because it's going to be a lot faster for the redraws, and it'll help us navigate very quickly to the spot where we actually want to be. And then when we zoom in close enough, we'll see the data from the remote server that may include data that was added from people in the field on a mobile device, or possibly edited by somebody else in a different office, etc. And so that data will be as up-to-date as possible. And so the way that we'll do that is we'll right-click on these layers, go to the Properties, and then under the Rendering tab, we'll click Scale Dependent Visibility, and we'll set the minimum scale in this case to 1 to 12,000. And then I'll click OK, and do the same thing for all these other layers. And then for our layers on localhost, we'll also go in and change those properties. But in those cases, we'll change the maximum scale to 1 to 12,001. And we'll do that for every layer in the localhost dataset. So now we'll have both groups of layers turned on, but set to be displayed at different scale ranges. If we look at this burrowing owl habitat right now, right in the middle of the screen, this is the one that we edited previously. It's the only one that's different between the remote layer and the local host. And you can also see which layers are actually being displayed currently because the ones that are not being displayed because they're not in the, at the correct scale are grayed out. So let's zoom in to 1 to 25,000 scale. And you see that was very fast again because we're looking at the data that's on local host. And this burrowing owl habitat is still pretty much rectangular. But if we zoom in, to 1 to 10,000 scale, we go below 1 to 12,000 scale. Notice that you'll see the change over here as far as what layers are displayed. And you'll also see that this particular polygon will change because it's reading from the host. So it's no longer rectangular. It's now look, I guess you would call that kind of a chevron pattern. And now we're zoomed in close enough that we could actually edit it with a reasonable amount of accuracy. And so at this scale, we want to see the remote data because that's the data that we want to be editing. But it doesn't matter too much if we're using the remote data at this scale because it redraws very fast. So that's one strategy that's relatively easy to implement that you can use to keep your people from pulling their hair out, waiting for redraw speeds, if they accidentally zoom out too far when you're working with remote data. Thanks for listening. This was just one lecture in an entire course on spatial databases focused on PostGIS and QGIS. And this course is available now on udemy.com. It has more than 70 lectures and 11 hours of content. And I'm adding more content all the time. And you can get it now for only $20 with the coupon code COURSE5. And if you're interested, you're also welcome to check out my other courses on WebGIS and QGIS. You can get more information on those at the following location. Or you can just Google Geospatial Brainstorming Courses, and it should take you right to this site.